Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I uh, want to apologize uh, right straight off. Uh, I have a throat condition uh, that may require some surgery, and it uh, quivers a little. Now, Susan knows I'm scared to death, but that's my excuse, and I'm telling you, and I'm sticking with it. It is a pleasure to be here with you today and, and to be with uh, friends. Um, talked about Julie and I going to uh, school together. I told the folks back there that she's older than I, so consequently I followed her in high school. But I carried her newspaper. So consequently, we knew each other very well. When I came down, they wanted me to rehearse. They were telling me I cannot go past this white line. There's a white line there that is hidden that I can't go that far. And I have to go so far over this direction. So I wanted to know where my wife is sitting. And uh, they told me she was going to be here. I was glad to know that uh, she's sitting on this side because I'm going to be speaking to this side most of the time, because she will be sitting there saying <laughs> all of this time. Um, it, it's great to be here with you and, and to, for people to speak about uh, what your accomplishments uh, have been. I was pleased to speak to the uh, master's group uh, earlier today. And one of the things that I said to them was this. No one does anything by themselves. If a person thinks that he or she accomplishes everything that people talk about, they are foolish because we have to do things with others and we have to get things done through others. And I have been blessed in my life to have good people and to have good people that was there always supporting me. For students uh, who are here, and I understand that you are captive, that you actually get a great point for being here. And to make sure that you're here, you have to put your pass when you go out. So consequently, you can't leave till I finish. So I am assured of at least having someone here today. Last evening, they asked me, what are you going to speak about? And I told the chancellor and Roseanne, I don't have a clue. I haven't even figured it out yet. And by the time that I finish, you'll probably figure that's true. For example, I could speak to you for a while about the things as to how I started in Charlotte, North Carolina, and how I was born on the wrong side of the railroad tracks, and how when I was growing up in a poor family that... Uh, we didn't know we were poor until somebody told us we were poor. And when I was growing up, my ambition was to be a Greyhound bus driver. That's what I wanted to be. I loved the buses and the Greyhound that was there, and I loved the gray uniforms that they wore. And it allowed me to be able to do what I wanted to do, tell people where to go. And as time went on and so forth, I had the pleasure of starting my own business. I've decided I didn't want to speak to you about that because that's history. That's past. Today I'm speaking to you on leadership in the 21st century. Now we've just begun the 21st century. So before you can speak about leadership in the 21st century, you need to investigate what we expect in the 21st century. Now, in the past couple months, I have read a book that was published last year by George Friedman, and it's entitled The Next 100 Years, A Forecast for the 21st Century. Now, Mr. Friedman says at the very beginning of that book that the events that's going to take place in this century will be no different than they have been in all the previous centuries. He says there will be wars, there will be poverty, there will be tragedies, there will be good luck. 
There will be people going to work, and today we truly hope that's the case. People going to work, people making money. There will be people falling in love. There will be people having children. And there will be people who grow to hate. But he said there's two extraordinary things that's going to take place in this century that have never taken place before. First, there will be a new age. And second, there will be a new world power that comes about. And as he spoke about the new age, he said that the European age as we have known it has come to an end. And that the North American age is coming to be prevalent. And it will be dominated by the United States of America. Now, he says it won't be that it will not dominate it because the United States is necessarily moral or just, nor that even that it has developed into a mature civilization. But it will simply dominate the North American age because of its history. And he goes on to explain that, which I want to carry on here. He identifies that there will be four world powers. The United States, Japan, Turkey, and the new world power that will come about will be Poland. Now he identifies that technology and science is going to be paramount in the control of the world. And he identifies what's going to take place in space and all of the space equipment and vehicles and the manned spacecraft that will be taking place to control. He identifies that solar energy will be the, the paramount energy, but it won't be on Earth. It will be a solar station that rotates 365 days, 24 hours a day, and gains the power and shoots the energy to the United States. Now, I'm not here today to defend or support Mr. Friedman's book. It is an interesting book. He certainly has the background and the experience to be able to project what he feels is going to take place. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to read this book. We know that no one can predict with accuracy what is going to occur in the future. We don't even know what will occur tomorrow. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not up to us to even know. Yesterday was history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is present. It's the reason they call it a gift. And that's the reason why we should live and order our lives today, because it's the only day that we've been granted. Now, as we look to predictions going into the 20th century, the president of the Royal Society said, man will never be able to create or to develop a heavier-than-air vehicle. And we know eight years later that such a vehicle was flown at Kitty Hawk. In 1899, the director of the United States Patent Office said, what can be invented has already been invented. And we know that to be wrong. In 1923, the Nobel Peace Prize of physics, of physics said this, Man will never be able to tap the power of the atom. And yet we know, just a little over 20 years later, that such a device and such a weapon was used to end World War II. Today we speak a great deal about weapons of mass destruction. And we have a tremendous concern about weapons of mass destruction, and we should. But we also know that once somebody launches first 
there will be so many others that will be launched that the world can be destroyed. Now, I think that we have a greater danger in the expansion of technology. And I want to speak to you about that a little bit. A couple of months ago, I had the privilege of becoming the honorary commander of the 927th Air Force Wing at McDill Air Force Base. And in one of my meetings with the commanders, I asked them, what is your greatest concern in the defense of the United States of America? Now, you would have thought they would have said a nuclear war. But the commanders of our Air Force said cyberspace. Cyberspace. And I want to talk to you a little bit about technology and the advancement of technology and it's what is taking place. And I want to take it based not so much on predictions, but what we know. For example, at the turn of the 20th century, the memory and the speed capacity of computers was doubling every three years. By mid-1950 and 60, the speed and the capacity of computers was doubling every two years. And today, it's doubling every 12 months. It is projected that by 2020, the speed and the memory capacity of computers will match that of the human brain. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have already experienced that. If you saw the program Jeopardy, and you saw where IBM supercomputers, Watson, went up against two of the sharpest and brightest minds that ever participated on Jeopardy, and the computer won. And you can say, yeah, John, the computer won. We know that. But people downloaded the information. All of the information was downloaded, not specifically for the questions, but just generally all of the information collected, downloaded, into supercomputers. But here's what was significant about that. The question was asked, and the computer understood the question and was able to research and to go through the memory and that quick, that quick, be able to give the answer in English. The computer understood that. And we are experiencing things that people talk about and matching the human brain. It is projected that on the concurrent track that we have in going through the computers and matching the building of computers, that humans can become an endangered species. They talk about machines being able to make machines. Ladies and gentlemen, that is already occurring. In the 1920s and 30s, there was a comic strip that was created called Buck Rogers. Now, not many of you even know about Buck Rogers. There was another one called Flash Gordon, but I'm only going to talk to you about Buck Rogers. Buck Rogers was uh, in the coal mines, and Buck uh, was a rescuer. There had been a cave in it called Coal Mine. And he and his group were sent in to rescue or to see if there were people to rescue. And all of those on his rescue team died. But Buck went to sleep. And he went to sleep for 500 years. And he woke up in the 25th century. And in the 25th century, he walked out of his cave and he walked into the, to the grounds of the United States that he knew, and it was devastated. It was being destroyed. And it was being destroyed by all of these little metal machines that were walking around, just destroying everything. And they thought that he was an enemy, but they took him in, and he became part of them, and they got into their spacecraft, and they took off into the outer space. And now they're fighting all of these folks. And all of their gun rates and everything else could not knock out the enemy's spacecraft. One became disabled, 
and Buck and her people got on it, and they were afraid to open the hatch because if they opened the hatch, they would find that there were people there, and they would shoot them and kill them. But they finally opened the hatch, and there was nobody there. And they went in, and there was nobody there. These machines were flying themselves. They were creating themselves, and they were being good targets, but they could not penetrate the metal. Now, I could go on about Buck and so forth, and I, I ordered all of the comic books, and I was going to show those to you here. But just trust me, that was what took place in the 25th century. Ladies and gentlemen, that's taking place today. Do you not understand that there's computers and machines that's making machines today? There are machines that are replacing people in their re redundant activities. And one of the reasons that we have so much unemployment today is because technology and science is replacing people. Billy Graham, in 1965, wrote in his book, World of Flame, that there was going to come a time, and he takes it from the, from the Bible, but there's going to come a time when the world will become so small and nations will become dependent upon each other and so dependent upon each other that there will be one world government, and under that world government will rise a president or a leader to lead the world, and it will be supported and maintained by technology. Now just look around. That's happening today. You can see in Europe in one nation after another depending upon a nation. The world is growing smaller and smaller every day. And in that will become a single world leader according to Dr. Graham and according to the Bible. And that person is an antichrist. And they're going to use technology. And during that period of time will be prosperity, will be people that uh, live and enjoy self. The morals of people will be destructive and they'll do anything that they wanted to. But this single individual through computers will decide and determine every single thing that people do and even decide the food that you will eat. Now that's a prediction. But it's happening. It's happening. And as you take a look at that, we look back and we, we say into history, what occurred that is similar to occurring today? And what is occurring today that is what's similar to the fall of the Roman Empire in 476? See if under these terms that it fell that you recognize anything. The currency was being rapidly devalued. Second, they had huge armies that were spread through all the world. And it was so expensive to take care of them that they couldn't maintain it. Third was collectivism or socialism because the monies and everything were going to the government. And the government produces nothing, but consequently they took it. And as a result, greed and power set in. Immigration was rampant. And immigration was rampant. And as a result of the immigrants, and so many immigrants, sex were set up. And you could not get a cohesiveness of the nation. The people had turned weak. Had turned weak. And felt an entitlement. And what things that they were entitled to was taken and turning people away from being able to do the things that they needed to do. They loved what was taking place. And consequently, the leadership became weak. And hence the fall of the Roman Empire. Just as George Friedman said, the turn of the century will see no difference. That there will be wars, there will be poverty, there will be tragedies, there will be good luck. There will be people working, making money, people falling in love, having children, and hating. That there's no change there. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no change in leadership in this century. It's any different 
than any century that has preceded it. There is nothing magic that I can tell you about leadership that you don't already know and practice. There are three skills that are needed to be a leader. First, you must be able to organize. Second, you have to be able to make a decision, tough decisions, timely decisions, and accurate decisions. And third, you must be able to communicate. Now, every one of you in this room possess those skills, believe it or not. I doubt seriously if anyone, when you came into this auditorium, went to look up the evacuation route in case we have a disaster in this auditorium. If you did, you were different. But I want to say to you that if we had a disaster and all of these exit signs were marked out, that someone in this auditorium would stand and say, follow me, I'll lead you out, and we would follow. Time and time again, it's been proven that leaders have risen that way. September the 11th, at the towers, there were people who had actually moved from the building to safety, and they turned and went back, and they were people of all makeup. They didn't have to be executives. They didn't have to be file clerks. They could have been anything. And they went and turned back and said, this way out. Most of them at their own peril. A fire captain was leading his team up the stairs while others came, came down. And the building began to rumble and shake. And he felt that the building was going to collapse. And he hollered, evacuate. And his men turned and they knew when that word came that they turned out the lights. And the only light that shone was the light of the captain, and they followed the light of the leader. And the building crumbled down the side of them, and they found themselves, after the crumbling, sitting atop of the fifth story of that floor. And they were saved because they followed the light of a single person. We experienced that in our military when people are sent out on a mission and people go out into the mission and their leader is shot down or wounded and can't carry on. And one in that group knows that the mission is not completed. And whether that person has a stripe on their arm or not stands and says, take care of the falling, we've got to move to our mission. And the people follow and lead. Never anticipating, never anticipating that there'd be a leader. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. Possession the skills of leadership, not enough. It's not enough. During the 21st century, I've got to say to you, is that you've got to hone those skills. You've got to be sharper than you ever have been before because of the speed upon which that you have to make decisions and you have to be able to make them timely and you have to be able to make them accurately. You have to be able to make them quickly. The attention span today for us is nine seconds. That of a goldfish. It's true. So consequently, just think putting yourself into decisions, making tough decisions. But that's not enough. Hitler made decisions. He had skills. The Antichrist that comes will have those skills and make that. It was not enough for us to be leaders in the 21st century. Now listen to me, because this is the thrust of what I want to say to you. What counts, what counts is how you make those decisions. And it's in here, and it can't be taught in a textbook. It's what's inside. It's what's in your heart. It's what your character is. And you have to be able to decide, am I going to do that which is right? Am I going to be able to make a decision based upon what is right and not what is good for me? That meism is taken out of it? I've got to tell you something. If we don't do that, we are destined 
for a disaster at all levels. It's our heart that counts. It's our character that counts. Have you ever seen an icicle form? And you know that the icicle forms one drop at a time. And it can drop and it can grow up to twelve inches sometimes. Now if you look at that icicle, and if that water has a speck of dirt in it, a speck, the icicle is cloudy and it's not pretty, it's brown. That's what happens to us as people. But if the water is pure, the icicle glitters and sparkles, and we marvel. And how wonderful that happens to be. My message to you today is not so much about what's happening in technology and things are happening fast and things are going around us and the world is becoming smaller and it's becoming smaller and, and we're having and facing economic troubles and everything. You know all of that. It's what you want to do with it. It's what you've got to do with it. And it sits inside of you. It's not what you want to do. It's what you want to be and what you must be in order to be a leader of anything, even yourself. Even yourself. We should be so constantly aware of the leadership at all levels, all levels of government and in business and everything around of us. And we can start with ourselves to make a difference. We must make that difference. And we must make that difference now. It has to come today. Choose this day what it is you want to be, not what you want to do. What you want to do with your life, that's what's important. You may not get tomorrow, but you will prepare yourself today for whatever comes tomorrow. That's it, period. That's my message to you. Take it.